Good morning. And Merry Christmas, I think, is in order this morning. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all that good stuff. Glad to have you here today at the Worship of God at First Baptist Church. If you're a guest and you feel inclined to do so, there's a visitor card in the pew rack in front of you that you can fill out and drop in the offering plate as it comes by later. That'll help us uh, stalk you and hunt you down uh, so that we can guilt you into church membership here at First Baptist. That was a joke, but it would help us to be present uh, to you and, and be uh, uh, available to you for any needs you might have. As we typically do, let's take a few minutes and look at the calendar of events that are included in your order of worship. Uh, you'll notice um, that it's a lot slimmer than December's are, and I heard the amen from the back corner. Uh, but it is slimmer, but there's a few things of note here. Uh, one, the closure of the church office on Thursday in observance of New Year's would be important. Also, uh, Janet Matthews' 58th anniversary as a staff member here, they'll hold your applause and we'll get that next Sunday when Janet's uh, here to receive it. Uh, we have Michael here today to play the organ. And we're grateful for you coming all this way to do that. So thank you, Michael. But uh, it, it is the time that we uh, notice Janet's anniversary. Skipping on down, uh, you'll notice that the Wednesday night rotation of activities begins again on January the 6th. So that's not this week, but the week after. So uh, make note of that. Dinner will be that night, prayer meeting uh, kids, youth, and uh, choir practice as well. Your offering envelopes are down in that hallway back there. If you need an offering envelope, you, you know, the little box of them, uh, they're down there for pickup uh, in front of the TEL chapel. And uh, one announcement on the back about cantata CDs, if you're interested in a recording of the cantata. That's all the announcements on here. Uh, other than for me to say that today is the first Sunday of Christmas tide. Christmas lasts for 12 days in the, Christ, in the Christian calendar, and we're at about turtle doves today, or maybe something one later than that. But who knows? It's Christmas tide, so Merry Christmas. And today I'll be preaching uh, from the story of the Magi. So listen as that one comes along, and you'll hear it in the music as well. But now, I guess uh, it's time for you to stand up and say hi to the people around you. Go tell it on the mountain, Jesus Christ is born. Hymn number 143, as we stand together and join our voices.
Almighty God, we've met Christmas after the waiting of Advent. Jesus Christ is born. Secure us in the story of Christ's birth and help us recognize that in Jesus' manger and in his cross, they lead us to more faithful living. Open us to worship today through our singing, through our hearing, and in our praying. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. If you'll take your litany, we'll read together. Christmas is a time to proclaim. We proclaim hope that is stronger than any trial. Joy to the world, the Lord is found. We claim a victory that is stronger than any defeat. We claim a peace that is stronger than any conflict. We claim a freedom that is stronger than any bondage. And we claim a love that is strong enough to save the world. To the world, the Lord is come. Today, we observe the lighting of the Christ candle in the middle of the Advent wreath. The candle wick is already blackened because the candle of Christ is first lit each year on Christmas Eve at Come and Go Communion to mark the birth of the Christ child in a manger in Bethlehem. Today we light this candle as a sign that Christmas is here and that it continues for ten more days. The first candle, the one that we lit all the way back in November, reminded us that Advent is a time to wait upon the Lord with hopeful endurance. The second candle reminded us that Advent is a time to watch for God's peacemaking presence in the world. The third candle reminded us that Advent is a time to joyfully prepare our hearts, our souls, our bodies and minds for the coming of our Messiah. The fourth candle reminded us that the one we wait for, watch for, and prepare for is Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Today we light the Christ candle that first flared on Christmas Eve. This candle calls us to proclaim the message of Christmas by celebrating what Christ has done in our lives and by sharing it with others. As the full light of the Advent wreath now fills this space. So may the light of Christ fill our lives. Your Advent carol is in your bulletin. Let's sing all five verses today.
The prophet Isaiah speaks of God's work to redeem God's people in Jerusalem. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes, and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away. Your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those of Sheba, shall come. They shall bring gold, frankincense, and shall proclaim praise to the Lord. Here ends the first lesson. In just a few moments, as we've done throughout Advent, we will sing together the Lord's Prayer. It's number 382 in your hymnal, if you'd like to mark that page with your finger. And as you do that, let's bow and pray together. Gracious God, it is good to be in your house this morning, in this season of Christmas. It is good to be here and to inch close to the manger, to the miracle of Christmas, to, to the hope that is ours because of that miracle. God, give us the experience of your divine presence this morning. Rest in our hearts. Move us whichever way each of us needs to be moved this morning. And God, as we pray for ourselves, it's important to pray for others. So we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are unable to get out of their homes. We pray for those who live in war-torn places in the world. We pray for those who don't have a church family and don't know the experience of joy that that can be. God, and most of all, most of all, we pray for ourselves. We pray for ourselves that we may continue to grow in the light of the Christ candle these next several days and all the year long, too. In Jesus' name, amen.
we can have all the kids come up. Well, oh, good. Uh, glad someone else, because Kaylee's tired of hearing me talk, so. <laughs> What's up, buddy? All right, all right. You get a high five. You get a lot of high fives. So, did y'all get a lot of gifts? You did? What'd you get? Um, I got a skateboard that looks like a half of a spoon and another spoon touched to together, and you can make it go farther, and it has one wheel on one side and one wheel on the other side. Wow, that's pretty cool. What did you get? You already know what I got. You do? <laughs> <laughs> She got a guinea pig. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so now Christmas is over. You didn't get no more gifts, huh? No. But that's not true because God gives us gifts all the time, right? Well, one of the gifts God gives us is talent. Um, and when we get a talent, we've got to give the glory to God that he gave it to us, right? I'm going to give you an example. Um, do you guys know Miss Tracy Barnett? Yeah? Say hi, Tracy. Okay. Did you know she plays piano? Not only does she play piano, but if you say, hey, Tracy, play this song, she's like, okay. She plays it. That's kind of crazy, right? So I asked Tracy, Tracy, how did you learn how to play piano? She said, God. God? That's kind of crazy, right? Well, God had to teach her because she learned how to play piano when she was like three. When I was three, you know what I was doing? Pooping my pants and eating dirt. <laughs> no way was I playing piano. So she said that God gave her the gift of playing piano. So anyways, not all gifts are quite as cool as Tracy's that she can just play piano. Some are being a good friend or good at math. But the Bible says, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, you give the glory to God. So when you get talents from God, make sure you give the glory to him. Okay? All right. Would anyone like to pray? No? You would? Awesome. Let's bow our heads. No. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for these kids, Lord. We know that when they were born, you knew everything about them, including their talents. Lord, we ask that as they figure out their talents, that you'll just help them to give you all the glory and give you all the credit for their talents, because without you, they wouldn't have them. Lord, we ask that you bless their families throughout this year. And Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After the shepherds come and go, Jesus' family is visited by the gentle magi from the east. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is this child who is born king of the Jews? For he observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so I may go and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that had seen, they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, 
They offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our hymn of stewardship is the carol, What Child Is This? Hymn number 148 in your hymnal. And let's stand together to sing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've made it through Advent. You've given us a part of you through hope, peace, joy, and love. And then you gave us all of you through the birth of your Son. So it's fitting that we return a portion of us back to you. Bless these tithes and offerings for the uplifting of your kingdom. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Mercy. Wasn't that good? Amen. I'm not sure you preach a sermon after an anthem like that. Maybe you just, that's it, and go home. But, uh, but I'm going to preach a sermon after that anthem anyway, lest you got excited. But it was good indeed. Thank you all for that piece. Um, throughout the season of Advent, um, we have consistently kept the focus uh, dial of the camera lens on the theme of fear, on the theme of fear, and it is woven into the text there, the text of prophecy and the text of the birth narrative that uh, happened later in the season in Bethlehem. We've held the camera there because, as I've said more than once this past month, we live in anxious and fearful times. On a national scale, we are fearful of everything from politicians who slightly disagree with us to Muslim extremists who wrongly interpret their religious tradition to sanction hatred and violence. On a smaller scale, we are afraid of state-level budgetary issues as well as economic aches 
statewide, and even right here at home. Add an oversized portion of social media to that mix, and we find ourselves wringing our hands, don't we? We find ourselves tugging at our hair, if we have any left, and tossing and turning at night over the state of the world. We live in fearful, anxious days. And over against that is Advent. Advent, the lectionary time that has guided us through the stories of Christmas, and time and time again, we've heard the angels say, you were right, you guessed it, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, or as the old King James is prone to say, fear not, fear not. When Joseph finds out about Mary's suspicious pregnancy in, the Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, the angel of the Lord says, fear not. In Luke's gospel, when Zechariah sees the otherworldly, strange figure standing before him, the figure turned out to be an angel, and it said to him, fear not. A few verses later, when the angel shows up in full vibrato, and offers to Mary a salutation that feels far too big for a small-town woman to handle. The angel responds to her, fear not. Another chapter into Luke's birth narrative, there are shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. These people weren't just afraid. No, if you read the King James Version, they were sore afraid. It's the best line. They were sore afraid. And the angel of the Lord says to them, even sore afraid, fear not. Whatever else these stories of Jesus' birth are, they're stories about the presence and the reality of fear and the command of the angels of Advent to fear not. The reality is there, and the command is to fear not. As I said earlier, today is the first Sunday of Christmas time. In the small hours between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, Christ was born. Christ is born, and the season of the church shifts from purple Advent to white Christmas tide. And Christmas tide is a season not just a day, it's a season that goes all the way through January the 5th. We're in the middle of it right now. And because of that, we dwell this morning with those magi, those magi. As I read and reread the magi story this week and this season, I did again find the fear thread woven through there. You see, you see it in Herod, most of all. Herod and his court that is described uh, maybe gratuitously by Matthew as all of Jerusalem. But Herod and his court, and much like the stories of Zechariah, Joseph, and Mary, this story, too, turns on the thesis that faithful obedience is to fear not fear not. Joseph and Mary are the early adopters of this. Uh, they're the early adopters of fear not, and God's story glides along smoothly on their courage. Zechariah gets it right after getting it wrong. Zechariah gets it right after getting it wrong because at first he's afraid. At first he doubts, and then later he believes and proclaims. And somewhere in the middle of that, Zechariah found his courage and was obedient to the angel's call to fear not. Then we get to Herod. Herod never quite makes it at all to fear not. And because he didn't, soon after the Magi depart, you know that story, don't you? that awful story about what happens to everybody that's two years and under in the area. 
Herod didn't make it to fear not. And because of that, some paid the price. One thesis of the birth narratives of Jesus says that when fear calls the shots, we become our worst selves. By, uh, by uh, the, same, the other side of the coin would say when courage calls the shots, however, God has given space to work and marvelous things, miraculous things can happen. As I read and reread the Magi story this week, I did find that it kept in line with the thread that we've traced throughout Advent. You see it in Herod, and you see it in the Magi. It was a passing comment uh, that some biblical scholar made that these two are foils of one another in the text. Herod's fear, the Magi's courage. There was another passing comment that a biblical scholar made that really stood out to me, so much so that I picked it as the sermon title that's on the sign out there. Um, and it was New Testament scholar Warren Carter. I'm sure you've all heard of him. Yeah, I hadn't either. But, uh, but he is good people. He's got a prominent position somewhere, which means he knows something about something. But he's a New Testament scholar at Texas Christian University. And he wrote this. Uh, he wrote this in the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary. And in fact, it's just, a, it's just a passing comment about this story. And this is what it says. The birth of Jesus, God's agent into the sinful imperial world brings two responses. The powerful sinner center rejects him. The powerful center rejects him. The empire strikes back as Herod Rome's vassal king over Judea tries to murder King Jesus. In contrast, insignificant people from the margins, the Gentile magi or wise men, and Joseph and Mary welcome God's initiative. I thought that was pretty good stuff. I thought that's pretty good stuff. In contrast, insignificant people from the margins, the Gentile magi, Joseph and Mary, welcome God's initiative. Now, in addition to including this quotation for the sake of the Star Wars fan in the back, you heard that Empire Strikes Back reference, right? Yeah, I, Warren knows his stuff, buddy knows his stuff. But in addition to that, um, I have included it because it points out tongue-in-cheek who the Magi really are in the grand scheme of things. Insignificant. Insignificant. So what? They have little money. So what? They are wealthy enough to travel. So what? They, as tradition claims anyway, might be royalty. So what? In addition to educated enough to serve in their old Gentile world as astrologers, prophets, leaders, so what? They are insignificant, Warren Carter says tongue-in-cheek, because they are not Roman, thereby powerful members of the elite imperial class. They are insignificant because they are not Jewish and thereby are not included in the genealogies of Jesus that Matthew so painstakingly takes the time to open his gospel with. They are insignificant because they are outsiders. They are outsiders who look different. They likely talk different. And they bring strange gifts, don't they? Really strange gifts. I saw a picture on Facebook this past week that said it had a picture of three women in it carrying things. And it said that after the wise men left, three wiser women came carrying gifts of diapers, towels, and formula. 
I, I thought that was close to right anyway. But they bring strange gifts. They look different. They talk different. And they show up, and they, like the star that guided them in, are gone about as fast as they appeared. There and gone. You ever wonder why Matthew included them at all? Matthew, writing his gospel, had to get the word from his editor, right, that 28 chapters, I'm capping it, buddy. You're done right there. And all this stuff, all these stories about Jesus, teachings and parables and, and miracles, and Matthew chooses to include these insignificant people who blow through and are gone. You ever wonder why? I think the why question is important. Why include this cameo of Gentiles from the East rather than another Jesus story? You know, one of those good ones from his adulthood. Admittedly, the answer to such a question is speculative, but my hunch is that it has to do with the theme of Advent text, which is, you guessed it, fear and fear not. You see, over and against Herod and the chief priest and the scribes, you know the significant people. Over and against them, the Magi offer an insight into insignificant people. Over and against the pitfall of futility, the wise men offer us a way to find meaning. In the summer of 2009, I spent three weeks as a part of the Middle East Travel Seminar. I've talked about METS before with you, but as I read this story about insignificant outsiders, I couldn't help but remember a story from my time traveling the Middle East. And this story took place in Jerusalem at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, by the way, is the traditionally accepted site of Jesus' death, crucifixion, burial, all that stuff uh, is traditionally accepted to have happened in and around that giant church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We went into the church, and it felt a little bit like West Town Mall on Black Friday in there. Yeah, it did, and what I mean by that is you go in, and you don't know because you've never been there before, and you expect this wonderfully reverent atmosphere. What you forget is that people from all over the world are just like you, and they're pilgrimaging to this church. So you get in there, and it's elbow to elbow, and it's languages from all over the world. It's a cacophony in this stone building, noise everywhere. When you go to the tomb that's over on one side of the church, you get in line to go in. And they herd you in and they herd you back out because there's a line out there that's never gone, right? And then you come back around through the church and this is the moment that stood out to me. It didn't stand out to me at the time, by the way. It stood out to me in my remembering this week. But in the other part of the church, there was this big rectangular spot in the room, allegedly where Jesus was beaten before he was led out to be crucified. And in that spot, around the edge, there were all these people laying on the floor, wailing, crawling across the floor, crying. And I, like a good pretentious theological student, stood off to the side, significant that I was, and observed this event. All these people here writhing on the floor, 
Mm. I knew because of my seminary training that emotions come and go. It's really the theology that has the staying power, right? And so I didn't participate in this event. In fact, none of the seminarians did. Instead, we watched, as significant people do, people with theological education do, and we watched, and then we moved on. I thought of that story, I thought of that moment, because I read the story of the Magi, and I looked up a word this week. The word was homage. You know, it's not like you go to Kroger very often and you're at the butcher counter and somebody uses the word homage, right? Has that happened to anybody in the room recently? I didn't think so. Homage is one of those church words that nobody else uses ever, I don't think. Uh, Certainly not the butcher in Kroger. Homage was a word that I wanted to know a little bit more about. And so I looked up the word homage, and uh, I looked up the Greek word behind it. Now, I'll probably butcher it with my Kentucky uh, accent, but the word is proscunio, the Greek word behind homage. Uh, write that down. Uh, it starts with a, with a pie. Uh, yeah. Proscunio is the word, and scholars would say that uh, the translation is probably something like to fawn, to crouch, to prostrate oneself in reverence, to worship. All those definitions are always interesting to me when I look up a Greek word, but what I really want to know when I look up a Greek word is what does it mean concretely? What does it mean tactily, because that's where I find the most gratitude in looking up Greek words. And so I looked at the etymology of the word, which is just the next paragraph down, by the way. And the etymology said that it was likely a compound word. From pros, meaning the place, by the side of, or near to. Pros and Kuon, meaning dog, dog, hound, dog. Proscunio means in the place of, by the side of, near to the dog. Concretely, it means that. Get that image in your mind for a minute. Where does the dog live? What does the dog do? What does it mean to proscunio, if you can say it like that? The place of, by the side of, near to the dog. Now, the magi are kings, maybe, but they're wealthy, they're foreigners, they're educated, And they paid homage or homage to Jesus. The Magi approached Jesus by the side of, near to, in the place of, the dog. You get that image in your head yet? One of my favorite movies is a Martin Sheen movie called The Way. It's about the Camino de Santiago across Spain. And at the end of that pilgrimage in the church there, there's an invitation to kneel down and walk on your knees from the threshold to a post and put your hand on it. Could that be what the Magi were doing here? Could could the Magi have been down on the ground crawling toward Jesus? I don't usually think of them that way. After all, they've got gold in their hands. But the word homage suggests that. By the side of, near to, in the place of, the dog. Hmm. You know, 
Only insignificant people are able to do such a thing because significant people are too proud to do such a thing. Only insignificant people don't miss out on the chance to kneel at the threshold and walk on their knees up and put their hand on that post at the end of the Camino. You see it in the movie, by the way, The Way. As I think about all that, as I think about this story, and I think about insignificant people, I hear a calling from the Magi, those Gentiles that blew through Matthew's gospel, to be a little less significant myself. To be a little less significant, a little more insignificant. You could attach the word humility to that. It fits. You could attach the word gratitude to that. It fits too. But the grace of insignificance, the grace of being insignificant people, is that it shrinks our overfunctioning. It shrinks our overreaching. And it reminds us that we are like the Magi and that it's our job to tend to our little corner. Now, the news won't tell you that. Facebook certainly won't tell you that. But the Magi certainly suggests that. While Herod is concerned about empire, while Herod is concerned about Rome and Jerusalem and factions and government and scribes, the Magi, insignificant enough to do this, crawl up to the manger and experience what Herod misses. Could that be the lesson of the Magi tucked away in there? Could it be the invitation to find a place to be a little less significant before God? I hear that. And I hear in it grace, grace that says you are responsible for your little corner and you yours and you yours and you yours. Oh, and me, Zach, who always needs to hear a word like this, me, mine, too. Because you know what the real rest of the story is? The rest of the story is that the rest of the story is God's part and that we play our little part and it fits just like Matthew put it in there, fits right up into God's great story. May it be so for all of us this Christmas season. Amen. We are pilgrims on a journey, brothers and sisters, on the way of Jesus Christ. 
It's our tradition at First Baptist Church that when we gather and walk a few steps of that journey together on Sunday morning, that an invitation is offered. This invitation is for each and every one of you in your pew where you are or down here, if that's the right place. But it's for each and every one of you to proscunio, to get a little bit closer to God, to be a little less significant and trust God's grace. Won't you consider that invitation this day as we stand and as we sing together? As, and now as you prepare to go from this place and continue the pilgrimage of Christmas, receive this benediction, this good word. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father. And as you go, remember, by the grace of God, you were born into this world. By the strength of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very hour. And by the love of God, the love of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you and we are being redeemed. Amen. Amen.